Brown. We have a lot of events coming up in the next couple of weeks. The Student Research Conference, most notably tomorrow. Many of the students who are graduating are actually going to be presenting some of their work and senior papers and research for master's work as well um, tomorrow at the Student Research Conference. So that's from 9.30 to 4 tomorrow, and the program is online if you need to see it. Uh, Dr. K, her EN 200 course is hosting a discussion of stereotyping and identity next Monday from 11 to 1215. Uh, the discussion spurred by the Trayvon Martin murder, and that's going to be in the Berry Gallery. So that's open to anyone in the Marymount community to so come on by and, and have a discussion. Um, Pulitzer Prize winning author Jennifer Egan is going to visit campus to answer questions about her novel, A Visit from the Goon Squad, next Thursday, April 26 at 1 p.m. And finally, the Bisson Humanities Lecture, named after our own colleague, Dr. Lillian Bisson, who is here. I saw her sneak in in the back somewhere. Will take place Friday, April 27th at 6 p.m. This year, the speaker is Dr. Jesse Aleman, who will speak on Wars of Rebellion, U.S. Hispanic Writings, and the American Civil Wars. Both of these last events are going to be right here in the auditorium. So we have a busy couple of weeks ahead for you all. As always, details of the events can be found on the department blog at, and I think you all, most of you have found this, alliteratenewsletter.wordpress.com. So try to bookmark us, keep up to date with what, what's going on. So now on to the main event. As many of you know, English Night is a chance to celebrate our graduating students and their accomplishments, as well as to sum up the year's events for the department. It was a really fantastic and productive year for us. The year saw many, many changes. We added two new professors to our department, Dr. Lee Johnson and Dr. Sarah Fickey. If you guys could please stand up and give a wave. I announced you all were coming, and here they are. So Dr. Johnson specializes in early American literature and Dr. Fickey in transatlantic literature. We were also very lucky to have had our own Dr. Kara Pekova awarded the Draggy Teaching Award last May, which is an honor bestowed upon an outstanding teacher by graduating seniors. So Dr. K, if you could stand, give her a wave. Our graduate program also saw some major changes this year with Dr. Howe stepping into the role of co-chairing the graduate program while we merged the humanities program back into the literature and language program. Next year we'll offer three tracks in the, at the master's degree level, the literature track, the humanities track, and language and composition. We're also going to offer a certificate in teaching English in tandem with Northern Virginia Community College. It was a busy year for students as well. As you all know, you visited Split This Rock Poetry Festival with Dr. K coordinated the National Players Shakespeare with Dr. Scott Douglas, hosted the Patricia Highsmith Film Showing and Panel with Dr. Howe, promoted the Sigma Tau Delta Food Drive and visited the Library of Congress to get your reader's card with Dr. Peebles. Oh, and one event I forgot to mention on the 30th, right, Dr. Scott Douglas, that's our film symposium this year. So even more coming down the pike. Um, so for a relatively small department, I am once again in awe of our colleagues and our students' productivity. One of the privileges of being chair is that you get to see the big picture of activities within the program and the curriculum, and I'm stunned by the amount we accomplished this year. I must say to the students that whether or not you realize it, you are here at a time of great energy and change within the department. As the Space Shuttle Discovery blasted directly overhead today, <laughs> I was at the Pentagon and it went really low, and then I came here and it circled around. I couldn't help but see it as an auspicious homage to human accomplishment. Even within our own program, I feel we are starting to build an intellectual legacy of human discovery and invention. Last week, I attended the National Conference of Popular Culture Association, and we had two undergraduates presenting at the conference, as well as five faculty members. In addition, we had two alumni presenters, one of whom I didn't even know was presenting until I bumped into her. Although this is a single example of the scholarly production of the department, I would say that many departments would envy and admire the level of achievement our program fosters among students, as well as the collegiality and dedication of our faculty. I think you will experience the creative achievement we hope for all our alumni in the reading tonight by Mary Ninji, Nelia Bell, Michelle Whitaker, as they read from their original play, The Hair Chronicles, which has been accepted into this summer's DC Fringe Festival. We celebrate this kind of accomplishment in part because these alumni scholars pursued their creative interests after graduation for the pure love of intellectual and creative achievement. And I hope that all of you who are graduating will find ways and reasons to follow the creative path of discovery. Indeed, the best reasons to read, think, and create are simply because you want to that it invests your life with greater meaning and expands your world. Creativity and engagement can help you toward employment, of course, but more importantly, and I really mean more importantly, it can help you explore your own relationship to the world around you and your place in it. Intellectual endeavor and creativity are tools that extend beyond the vocational. They are tools that will help you make sense of a world that often makes no sense at all, to survive grief, to celebrate love, and to make brave leaps of faith when rational minds would go no further. 
So I encourage this year's graduates to pursue worthwhile professional interests, to be pragmatic, to network even tonight with our alumni. Let us know the types of jobs that you will seek after graduation, the graduate programs that you would like to enter in the future, and to line up your post-graduation references and keep in touch with us via the new email accounts you're going to have post-graduation. Uh, please, be my Facebook friend. <laughs> be any of our Facebook friend. But I also encourage you to continue to read, to write poetry, to see plays and films, particularly the Hair Chronicles coming to the DC French Festival this summer, to view the world with a lovingly critical eye, and to express your own unique vision in the ways that you have learned while you were here, as well as to invent new ways to express yourself. I do not think you will ever regret engaging in the life of the mind. It only offers you better vision and more choices. As Anne Lamott says, quoting her own father in the book Bird by Bird, that you all should have read in EM301, Writing Process. If you always have a book, you will never be alone. And that is what I would wish for our graduates, that you never feel truly alone in the world, and that you reach back to us when you need us, whether that is the week after you graduate or a decade from now. Now I want to celebrate your accomplishments over the last few years. Our first item of business always is to recognize the graduating seniors and graduate students. We've put together a little multimedia slideshow that I fear is not working. And therefore, we will retreat to our format. Is it working? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. You know what we can do is show it at the end, right, with the conclusion after, after the Hair Chronicles reading. Because they have worked really hard. People came in, the graduates came in and, and gave sort of sound bites, and it's a photo show. And it tells you a little bit more about them, their interests, and the things that they've been working on. Um, but we're going to have to retreat to our prior format, which is you just walk on up here as I read your name, <laughs> and I'll say a little bit about you. Um, so uh, Dr. Peebles, Dr. Karapekova, if you can help me hand out the student awards, that would be great. Our student awards, we try to select them for you individually. Uh, we do put some thought into which their books. I'll tell you that right, right now. Uh, but we put some thought into what matches your own interests, and we try to get ones that tie somehow to Marymount and to your experience here, whether they're local writers from the local community, writers who visited campus, or in some occasions, our own books that we think you might like. So if you could actually come on up, and I'll read each student's name and tell you just a little bit about them as they come up. And if you can hold your applause till everyone has come up. When you come up, if you can come up this side of the stage, walk over. So we can all say hi and then go off the other side. All right, so our first, our undergraduate, Dana Blow, is graduating in May, having completed a number of poetry and film projects and served as editor of Blue Wing, Mary Mouth's magazine of literature and art. She's going to present her paper, Storytelling from a Trans Man Named Yahweh, at tomorrow's student research conference, and she's currently completing an internship at the Human Rights Campaign Fund. Joss Cook, if Joss is here. We'll be graduating in August with a BA in the literature track. He's currently completing his senior project through the Liberal Studies program. Alex Leoncio served as student manager of the Shakespeare Open House this past month. The workshop featured work by 95 students in seven courses at Marymount. Alex served as liaison to faculty in art, fashion, and writing courses. Set up all of the Taming of the Shrew posters and installed artwork work and rare book displays. Adrian Morris presented her paper on Patricia Highsmith this past weekend in Boston. She was one of our students who presented at the Popular Culture Association. She was also a student contributor to the Magnificat. I'll give them a pause while they, so you guys, you're supposed to sit down closer to the front. Um, Mary O'Connor. Mary will be graduating in December in the literature track. She has served as a resident assistant, looks forward to doing an internship for an environmental or educational organization. Rochelle Smiley is currently completing her internship at the National Geographic Society and will be receiving her degree in May. She was a finalist in the Marymount Poetry Contest and winner of the Blue Ink Prize for Literature. This is Mary. <laughs> Dalva Toulouse, if Dalva can come on, is graduating in May with her bachelor's degree in English. And let's give a round of applause. These are all our undergraduates who are graduating. So congratulations. Now for our master's degree students, first come the master's of arts and literature students. First we have Thayer Dorch, who will be graduating in December 2012 and is currently working on her thesis regarding double consciousness in African American drama written by women. She also works as a tutor in our Learning Resources Center. Oh, we want to applaud for the graduate students one by one. No, you have to hold, hold your applause. 
Uh, Stephanie McDevitt is graduating in May and has served as our president of the Sigma Tau Delta Honor Society. She thinks it's just because she's tall and we made her, but there were other reasons too. <laughs> Lindsay Murphy will be completing her master's thesis on the troubling anthology anthologization, canonization, quite a mouthful, of Flannery O'Connor's Good Country People and Joyce Carol Oates, Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? in December. She's presenting her research on Intazaki Shangas for Colored Girls tomorrow at the Student Research Conference. And now for our Master's in Humanities students, Mark Dwinnells is defending his thesis on the right to bear arms but the duty to shoulder them this May and is also presenting tomorrow at the Student Research Conference, I believe, right? No, I presented at Oh, you present. I knew there'd been a presentation. Even better. Sarah Hahn is currently performing her practicum at the Archives of the National Cathedral. She's graduating with her MA in Humanities in May. Be careful. She is also agile <laughs> and light of foot. Erica Prong is defending her thesis Into the West, J.R. Tolkien's Landscape of Hope in May. She also works as a peer tutor in the Learning Resources Center and will be presenting her paper on Black Messiahs and African American Drama at tomorrow's Student Research Conference. <coughs> She's walking very carefully. Well done. Gabrielle Fondas Rojas will defend her thesis on the English Exodus to Ionia this May. And Gabby, you're presenting tomorrow also at the Student Research Conference, right? All right, so that's a big round of applause for all our graduating graduates. Well done. And our master's degree students do defend their theses, and the thesis defenses are open to the public. So please come on by and listen to them talk about their work, their friendly affairs at which we ask questions. Now Dr. Amy Scott Douglas is going to present the Robert Reed Prize for Outstanding Essay published in our student journal of nonfiction, Magnificat. Bob Reed was a long-term adjunct faculty member for Marymount's English department who inspired many students with his love for writing and his love for his neighborhood in Old Town Alexandria. After the Magnificat Award, Dr. Sean Hoare will announce the winners of our Evelyn Ludlow Award for the Best Senior Seminar Essay. Evelyn Ludlow was the chair of the Department of English for many years and helped guide the department during its many transitions during the 1970s. Hi everybody. So I get to give out lots of awards actually. Um, this year's edition of Magnificat here and also on display in the back and in limited edition for the students who are in it this year um, until we get another press run. Uh, this year's edition of Magnificat is called Life Story. The sec sections include one, setting, two, character development, three, supporting cast, and four, readers. The creative nonfiction pieces and the analytical essays in the setting section relate to the ways in which people's identities are shaped by the places that they live in. The section on character development focuses on inner conflicts and takes us inside the minds of a variety of subjects, from the monologues in Shakespeare's Macbeth to the thoughts in a Marymount student's mind. They're quite different, you'll be happy to know. <laughs> Section three, supporting cast, includes writing that focuses on familial relations, both in literature and in life. And the final section is about the way that readers and audiences are shaped by the literature that we consume from Renaissance drama to 19th century Gothic novels to contemporary fantasy literature like the Harry Potter series. Before I recognize the contributing writers, though, I want to acknowledge the editorial board, which is very much my editorial board, right? I have worked with these students for two years now. The board includes Ben Reigel, Caitlin Manka, Melanie Sue, Ariel McManus, and Walter Botlick. Today I want to recognize three of these editors in particular, for whom public recognition is long overdue, and they are those editors who have worked with me now on two full Magnificat editions. It's a lot of hard work. The first is Ariel McManus, who I found out this year is a public relations genius. 
turns out that this lovely student who seemed so shy when I first met her last year can deliver a sales pitch better than any used car salesman. It was largely because of Ariel who volunteered her time to visit classrooms and encourage her peers across campus to submit their writing to Magnificat that the journal received an unprecedented 67 entries for the 2012 issue. So thank you, Ariel. Melanie Sue has been my go-to person throughout the editing process, but especially in the manuscript uh, proofing stage. It's not typical to be able to give an 80-page manuscript to a sophomore, I think she's a sophomore, and have them be able to edit it for you. Melanie usually does this in less than 24 hours, um, and it's always pitch perfect, and she always says, here you go, Dr. Scott Douglas, and puts an exclamation point in her email. Um, and Walter Botlick, also returning editor on Magnificat, is just consistently solid. When I have to return a contributing writer's work and say it's just not publishable yet, I know that Walter will say, okay, I'll keep working with that person. Um, he just doesn't give up. So, so that I can give you a small token of my great thanks for your work on Magnificat over the years, I'm asking Melanie Sue, Ariel McManus, and Walter Botlick, would you please come and join me on stage? If you know Walter, you know that his trademark is an exclamation point. So on the front of his envelope, I always put an exclamation point in any publication as well. Well, this year, Ariel and Melanie got exclamation points as well. Whichever way you want to go, I know. I'm just glad you're here. Okay. Um, now to our contributing writers. Our contributing writers have a wide range of majors. This issue includes majors in business, nursing, graphic design, biology, psychology, with a minor in art history, oh, and English. <laughs> I will recognize each of our contributors individually by name, and we want to recognize you by giving you a copy of your now published work. Um, and I have Susan it will help me. Um, so, so could you just stand where you are, um, where your name is called, and remain, remain standing, please, for applause at the end. Alicia Romero, Carrie O'Donnell, Melanie Sue, Catherine, last name I can't pronounce. <laughs> right, are you there, Catherine? Thank you. Um, Brooke Wen, Bobby Crocker, Emma Wallace, Jamie Thomas, Courtney Deal, Caitlin Manka, Adrian Morris, Stephanie Barros, Jessica Butcheroff, uh, Shelley Coates, and Eric Jefferson. Can we have a round of applause to thank the contributing writers for having us? My last um, uh, responsibility is to announce the award winners. Um, I'll start with the Reed Prize winter, a winner, who unfortunately can't be with us tonight because she's attending a lecture in Washington, D.C. Um, every year we award the Reed Prize to an outstanding essay published in Magnificat. This year's winner is for a paper written in Professor Adam Kovacs's Metaphysical Philosophy class. It is entitled Science Fiction and Metaphysics uh, psychological discontinuity in Daryl Gregory's second person present tense. It was written by biology major and art history minor Emma Wallace. So Adam, I'll, I'll give you her certificate if that's okay and, um, after, after the announcements. I also have two honorable mentions this year, um, which is a category that I installed. I'm not sure if this category will last after I'm no longer editor, but it exists for now. Um, and the first one is to Carrie O'Donnell for her creative nonfiction piece titled Dirty Richmond. The second is to Adrian Morris for her research paper on the literary figure of the male guardian in novels by Anne Radcliffe, Elizabeth Inchbald, and Nora Roberts. So if uh, Carrie and, and Adrian are here, if you would please join me on stage so I can give your awards. Thank you.
Fifty percent. I'll take it. And my next award, no, I'm just kidding. Um, up on tap next is Dr. Sean Hoare, who will present the winner of the Evelyn Ludlow Award. Hi. Uh, the Evelyn Ludlow Award is given annually for the best paper written in senior seminar in the judgment of the faculty of the English department as a whole. Uh, I'm the teacher of that course, but I have nothing to do with the voting. And there's a, there's a time lag between the end of senior seminar and voting and the atmosphere ch can change, and sometimes the winner is the one I would have selected myself, sometimes not. Uh, in this case, uh, in this case, I wasn't even there on the day of the voting, and the papers are read anonymously. So it's my impression that the majority of faculty members who participated uh, do not know who the who the winner is, uh, and will will be surprised. Um, okay, and the only other thing to say about it is there is a there is a material reward, but the highest honor attached to the award is that the student gets his or her name in the senior seminar syllabus uh, as long as the grass shall grow and the and the rivers run. <laughs> okay, so that said, I would like to present the Evelyn Ludlow Award for 2011-2012 to Alex Leoncio. And I also want to say thank you to Dr. Hoare for coming in and presenting the Senior Seminar Award. I was deathly afraid I would have to present it this year, and nobody does it quite the way Dr. Hoare does it. He also works tirelessly, as those of you who have survived Senior Sem know, to make sure each senior produces their best possible effort for the Senior Seminar Prize. So I'd like to just give you a round of applause, too, as well. Thank you, Sean. So now, at last, we come to the portion of the evening where the graduating students can just sit back and relax and enjoy themselves. And now we put the pressure on the alumni. So we are now going to hear our alumni, Nelia Bell, Mary Ninji, and Michelle Whitaker, give a reading from their original play, The Hair Chronicles. They'll be assisted with stage directions read by current graduate student, Jamie Thomas. And if you all can kind of come up and get situated, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the origins of this project and where it came from. So The Hair Chronicles grew out of a semi-autobiographical project that the three authors first started in their social upheaval and drama course here at Marymount. And it has been a wonder to watch this work grow and change over the years. It doesn't bear that much resemblance to what they actually started with in class. I saw them give a reading to a packed house at Busboys and Poets earlier this year, and their command of the stage and the material was remarkable. 
It came as no surprise to me that this play was accepted into the DC Fringe Theater Festival this year. And we'll be sure to post updates about showtimes on the blog as well as the details of all the performances this summer. So please welcome Neelia, Mary, and Michelle as they read from The Hair Chronicles. The Hair Chronicles, scene one. This, this is, is a story of a black girl, an African girl, and a mixed girl, grounded in the fears of shears, the strength of women, and the weakness of ourselves. Yet, with each story, we open the doors into what mixes who we are. The big questions surround the little questions. Still, I question the questions. Does the hair on my head define me? I cannot be defined by the questions when I'm still searching for the answers. But where are the answers? Can they be found in strength in the strength of women like my mother? She taught me everything I know about keeping my black girl hair intact. But years later, could I go natural? Oh no, I wouldn't dare. Just think of the stairs, and I'd be way too aware of the isolation I might face from members of my own race. Are they evident through my own fears of looking into my own mirror? The reflection doesn't lie, and it's hard to find beauty when your hair has been fried. Are the answers somewhere in my search for acceptance and belonging? Maybe the questions don't have answers of right or wrong, or good or bad. My answers could just equate to me being me. I exist outside the box. Just like a hairstyle, it's all about trial and error. And whether dyed, permed, colored or burned, relaxed, infused, curled or bruised, cut or dry, damaged or teased, I'm still here. I still have my hair. I still have my roots. Connecting me to something bigger than what we see. Telling a story of turmoil and struggle of those who came before and those who opened doors. My roots are indicative of my history and although my future is a mystery and I'm constantly searching for consistency and seeking discovery of the rest of me. I still have my story and I still have my roots. Even if we still don't know the answers. The questions keep us searching. We know our story. This, this is, is a story, story of a black girl, an African girl, and a mixed girl. Scene two, black girl and mixed girl are sitting in a library meeting room studying. African girl enters scene. I have to go, mom, really. Sorry I'm late. My mother, can you believe she's still bugging me about putting on weight so I can get married? That's funny because my mom would say I won't find a man unless I lose 10 pounds. Why does it always come down to weight? Oh no, she would also say I need to have my hair done and never leave the house without makeup. Did she watch Oprah on the regular? She did, but I've heard it from a lot of people. Hey, I'm not worried about that stuff. I have five papers, two finals, and the last thing on my mind is getting married. Can't you multitask? You know, I really think you should explore this and write about it. Oh, now that's a good paper topic. The changing marriage standards from, I don't know, you can always use Jane Austen. Mm, oh, from the Victorian area, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. No, Jane gets confused with Victorian, but she's still considered Regency. Yeah, I learned that the hard way. Last semester, I called one of Jane Austen's characters Victorian, and I got mapped on a whole grade. True story, Jane Austen never got married, but she wrote in depth about marriage, the standards of marriage. So there's a lot to pull from. Yeah, I know, she never married, but judging from what I've read, I bet she had a scandalous life. Okay, we know you hurt Jane Austen, but you really need to think about what you're gonna write about. It really does sound like a good paper, though. I always feel like her writing really captures the experience of British upper-class life. You need to defect already. Okay, we're all here, let's talk about our topics. But I can't concentrate. Even from Africa, she still wants to have a say in my life. You know, I know she's still upset I changed my major. What did she want you to major in? Business. <laughs> yeah, I'm a source of disappointment to her. Here I am, an artist. My parents wanted me to be an engineer. Really? 
She thinks I need to be a businesswoman. Sorry. She still manages to have a say in my life. I know she thinks I'll never get married. Screw that. Do you think you're going to get married? I don't know. I'm, it's not something I think about all the time. But I don't think I need to, to waste my time plumping and primping to get a man. Okay, as after school special as I'm going to sound, you shouldn't have to work so hard. Just be yourself. That does sound like an after school special, I but it was. <laughs> you, you do just have to be comfortable. I know, but it's my mother. She has a way of pushing just the right buttons. And the little things she says, they just stay with me. You know, I was doing my hair this morning and all I could think about was her saying, you are not going outside like that, are you? What's wrong with your hair? It's unkept, it's wild, it's not tamed. You know, I think she would say it's ugly. Scene freezes. Spotlight on African girl. So, as a child, I thought my hair was impossible because it was a lot of hair and it was long and kinky. But my mother, she knew what to do. She would wash, she would hot comb, and then braid it every single week. This one day, I remember she spent the better part of a Saturday afternoon washing and hot combing my hair. And for some reason, that day, she didn't braid it. She just left it hanging down my head. There was my hair free and not bound in braids. I ran around the neighborhood with my hair bouncing up and down my head, free like it had never been before. And for one, one moment, I actually thought, believed that I had pretty hair. Of course, that feeling didn't last because a couple of months later, my mother cut it all off because I got the chicken pox from my brother, Moshiri. You know, I even have a picture to prove it. I have this, I, I even have a picture to prove it. I'm wearing a short pink dress, white knee-high socks that come up to my knocked knees, and I have very short, short hair. I have these saddest eyes in that picture. You know, I don't remember crying or fussing about losing my hair. You know, maybe I was too young then to realize how unattractive I looked. Or maybe I was too sick to care about being vain. Or maybe I didn't know then that a girl needs her crowning glory. Anyway, now thanks to my mother, I have a picture of me with no hair. Scene unfreezes. For the record, your hair isn't ugly, and mothers always have something to say. She is right. For your hair, your weight, your makeup, what outfit you need to put on, definitely she'll tell you what you need to take off. Your, your mother will always have an opinion. But your hair's not ugly. It's trendy. It is? It's I your style. Even everyone has their own style. Sometimes it takes years to find. Any stylist will tell you that. Okay, but is it a hairstylist or is it a hairdresser? You know, I still call them hairdressers. I think it's a generational thing. My mom went to a hairdresser. I go to a hairstylist. Mm, okay. They do the same thing. <laughs> hey, I will call them whatever they want to be called as long as I can find someone to help me maintain this no fuss, low maintenance stage I'm in. Mm, that should be easy enough. You have to have an idea of what you want going into mm. the salon. She's right. Hairstylists are going to have all sorts of suggestions. Grow it, color it, trim it. I think that's my problem. I don't know what I want, but I want it to be low maintenance. I'm the first to admit that my hair is high maintenance. <laughs> you just have to know how much effort you're willing to put in. Ugh, I don't know. I really don't know. I want your hair. <laughs> then you have to put in the at work. I'm much too lazy for that. You're not lazy. You're, it's just what I do. I built that time into my schedule. It's not effort anymore. It's just part of my routine. Scene freezes. Spotlight on black girl. Saturday night at my house involved a torture session for me. My dad would flee the house as soon as bath time because he didn't want to be present for what happened next. And what happened next? It can only be described as torture. Okay, so maybe it was only torture to my six-year-old self. Regardless, for two hours, every Saturday night, I had to sit still while my mom worked to turn my wild, crazy, out-of-control hair into the picture of perfect Shirley Temple curls. This process tested our mother-daughter bond. 
the other six days of the week, we were as thick as thieves. My mom was my role model and best friend. However, when Saturday came, I didn't want to be anywhere near her. She would become the woman who would be pulling my head in a million different directions. She would be the one with the hot comb entirely too close to the back of my neck. And she would be the one who would force me to sleep on what felt like a thousand pink sponge rollers. At church the next day, she'd flash one of her big warm smiles whenever someone said how cute I looked. She even smiled watching me twirl around and around in one of my flowing skirts. I think she liked the way my hair looked when I was twirling. Me? I just like to flash everyone with my ruffled panties that match the ruffled socks. <laughs> my mom, who was not an arrogant woman, took great pride in seeing me in my Sunday best with a head full of curls. The whole purpose of this experience didn't really become clear to me until years later. My mother set the standard of beauty for me and taught me beauty requires work. You have to be willing to make time and put in, put in the work. She always did. Scene unfreezes. African girl is unpacking her stuff to begin research. I, I admire your commitment, but it's just too much work. Okay, but we've gone over this. You just need to find a style that works for you. I don't even know where to begin looking for my style. I don't even know where to begin with this paper. So have you made any progress? I've done some research. Oh, so you know what you're writing about? Mm, it's been more of a lifestyle type of research. Yes, I found new shoes and possibly a new trip to take. You're always traveling. Where are you going this time? Okay, no, no, no. We don't have time for travel talk, ladies. We just, we kind of need to focus. All right, what are you thinking about writing about? Let's talk about that. I have 50 million ideas and I can't pin down one. First, I was thinking postmodern identity. Okay. But then I was thinking the meta narrative involved with the commodification of vacations. I don't even know what that means. Uh, I think it's just a fancy way to justify taking a vacation for research. Basically, I've got nothing. You know, neither do I, though. Of course, I wanted to get into mixed race identity issues because that's what I always talk about. We know. Hey, hey, listen, it's my passion. I've had issues since I was a kid. You guys know this. Scene freezes. Spotlight on mixed girl. My dad came home from work excited to give my sister and I new t-shirts he bought. It was a white shirt with African print on it, and the front read, Black by Nature, Proud by Choice. I remember sharing my dad's excitement and proudly wore it to school the very next day. Looking back, I wonder what my mom, who wasn't black by nature, thought of the shirt. I never asked her, though. I just put the t-shirt on and marched to the bus stop beaming. At school, it was business as usual, and if people asked me about my shirt, I proudly replied, my dad got it for me. As the day progressed, I had strong suspicions that conversations were happening about me behind my back, whispering in the hallway and smirks and giggling as I entered a room. And finally, during computer lab, one kid sitting across from me asked why I was wearing my shirt. I said, well, my dad got it for me. He said, uh, but you aren't black. You don't look black, you don't talk black, and you get good grades. Black people don't get good grades. Even though I pleaded with him, this kid was sure I wasn't black. My bubble popped. The day didn't get any better, and when I boarded the bus to ride home, I was met by a chant as I walked to my seat. Black by nature, liar by choice. I remember trying to justify myself to a few people around me, but mainly I just fought back tears. I couldn't let them see my tears. My bubble popped. After the seemingly longest bus ride ever, I cried as I walked home and I cried to my room and I took off the shirt that caused me so much grief. Now how could my dad give me a shirt that just wasn't true? During dinner conversation that night, I asked my dad what I'd been waiting to confirm all day. Um, dad, um, am I black? He answered the way he always did with a question. Are you black? Uh, yeah, Dad, am, am I black? Of course you're black. Who told you you're not black? You're black. <laughs> Things were so absolute in his mind, and it seemed to make sense, yet it didn't. 
And so it began, the first time I remember questioning who I was, all because someone gave me all the reasons why I wasn't. My bubble was popped. Scene unfreezes. You can't write another paper on mixed race issues unless you're willing to get a little bit deeper. Yeah, she has a point. You kind of stay on the surface when you write about these oh, things. All right, okay, whatever. You know, we still need topics. Maybe a quick break first? Yeah, we could, I could really go for some caffeine. Yes, caffeine will solve all our problems. Okay, okay, fine. Okay, fine. We will go, but when we come back, we really have to focus. End scene. <laughs> We have just a couple of minutes if you want to ask them any questions about their work, and then this is our last thing before we take a break and get some food and enjoy the free book table. But do any of you have any questions? As you can see from the blurbs in the program, they're all three really interesting people as well as having <laughs> produced an interesting play. So they all have very different sort of hobbies, interests, and professional lives. But do any of you have any questions about the play or its origins or how it's going to play at French? Yeah, Mark. Were there any other Any other one? Yeah, this. Well, they just gave you the first scene, so there are a lot yeah. more yeah. Yeah. within this, the play yeah. itself. But are there any you thought about including but actually then end up cutting? Many yes. of them. Yes. 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 As you can see from when we graduated to the fact that it's 2012, we have been through a lot of iterations of the play, so um, it's taken its own journey. Um, and, and one little plug that we would like to make is we also got accepted into DC Black Theater Festival. And it's at Howard on June 30th. So that's our other plug besides Fringe. So <laughs> that was fun. our first two scenes. And we gave you a little tidbit. And hopefully you'll catch the rest of it um, at the theater festivals over the summer. We were trying to keep it one hour. And so we had to negotiate which uh, of the anecdotes can stay and which ones are for next time. <laughs> yes. Are you all performing? No. <laughs> we hope you can find out. We can ask that every time. We are not performing it. No, we are. Um, we, we've done the readings, but um, we really, uh, I think we're really excited to see it on stage uh, just because we're not actresses as much as it's personal to us. We've decided to kind of take a step back and let the craft of acting um, dictate, you know, how it goes. And we're, we're really excited about seeing somebody else do it, not just because we're terrified to get up here but um, really just you know to <laughs> to see how it how it takes off so yes other questions yes in the back uh, my question is for, uh, yes okay so how much time do you have <laughs> um, <laughs> yes uh, yes it, um, and we get deeper into it in the play but yes it still happens I think um, uh, we were talking to actual potential director yesterday, and Michelle brought up a good point. She's um, she's bla a black woman, and her uh, daughter is mixed. Um, she said she's uh, half El Salvadorian, and she said uh, before she was even born uh, in the womb, they were like, "Oh, your baby's going to have good hair," and she just she you know she made her connect to our play, which made her us love her even more. We're like, "Great, can when can you start?" But um, you know, just the fact that the conversation had happened before the, her baby even got here, so. It does happen, though, yes. I mean, I'm sure anyone who is mixed might be able to relate. or, But uh, that's the biggest question I get hit with. And people come up to me after and say, I feel the same way you do. Or, so we keep plugging our play. We're like, come see the rest of it so we can talk about it. Any other questions? Other questions? All right, thank you all. Yay, thank, thank you. you. And I did. I forgot our sort of pinnacle crowning glory, actually. We, did, we can't eat quite yet because I have to announce our outstanding undergraduate and outstanding graduate student in English this year. So thank you all so much. Um, our outstanding undergraduate and graduate awards are established by not just GPA, but also your contributions to the program. And again, it's something that the English department faculty as a whole uh, decides upon each year. So if you can just come up. We do have a certificate for you. Our outstanding undergraduate is Adrienne Morris.
You want the money? If only it worked out. Thank you. And our outstanding graduate student is Stephanie McDevitt. And then again, let's just give a round of applause to all our graduates for your very hard work over the last few years. Well done. And there's only one other thing that I want to point out to you, which is we do have some of our Emerita faculty back tonight. So if you can give, give a wave to Alice Mandanis is back, Lillian Bisson is back. And as many of you have noticed, Susan Fay is back almost every day because I'm making her teach a course. <laughs> and Dr. Karen Waters will be back this summer as well. So even our retired faculty like to stay involved. Now, if we can just take a break, go to the Barry Art Gallery. I, I hope we can set up the slideshow that didn't work tonight also. Maybe put it out so that people can take a look at the, the clips that our graduating students put together about themselves and their work. And don't forget again the Student Research Conference tomorrow where many of these same people will be presenting the actual work that they were honored for tonight. So thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>